All right. How y'all doing? All right. Hello. Um, fun part about going last is this is not my first beer, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, these fun little creatures called uh, X-ray binaries and uh, their related objects, uh, black holes and neutron stars. Um, so this is probably the, an artist rendering of the most famous one. This is a SIGX one. Um, so you have a compact object, which I'll talk about in a minute, either a black hole or a neutron star. This happens to be a black hole. Um, and then a, another star in orbit with it. Um, typically a normal star, not too different than our own sun. Um, but you've got this material, um, the, they're so close together that this gravitational tidal, tidal interaction happens. And the atmosphere of the star gets pulled off and onto the compact object. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in a nutshell. Um, I am from San Antonio. I am from Southwest Research Institute. Um, Woohoo! Um, and uh, I was a grad student at UT, so I'm um, native of Austin. Um, so, <laughs> all right. Oh, did I hit the wrong thing? Thing click. That second beer, though. I know. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is going to be a fun talk. All right, bear with me here. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about what X-rays are. Um, I'm sure you've all had an x-ray done at some point in time. Um, the first one was actually done in 1895 um, by a fellow named Röntgen, and he took a picture of his wife's hand, and this is the, the picture that he took. Um, he didn't know what type of radiation it was at the time, so we call it X because that's what happens when we don't know what something is. We call it X or dark. Those are our two options. Um, so he called it X. Um, and actually, they're still called X-rays, um, although if you go to uh, any of the German-speaking countries, they will still call it Röntgen rays um, on occasion, but we know them as X-rays here today. There we go. Um, so an X-ray. So an X-ray is uh, just part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you're probably all familiar with visible light. That's the light you see coming into your eyes, uh, the rainbow ranging from red to violet. Um, but there's more to it than that. Um, if you go further red, you've got infrared, which we've already heard about, uh, thanks to uh, Sophia. And uh, if you go past the infrared, then you've got into radio waves, and that's the type of uh, dishes that uh, SETI is looking at uh, in the radio waves. If you go on the blue side, uh, shorter wavelengths, higher energy, then you've got ultraviolet into the X-ray, and then the gamma rays are the highest energy. Now, for a lot of things in astronomy, um, what type of light an object is producing is directly correlated to its temperature. And so bluer means hotter, redder means cooler. So if you compare a candle flame versus a blowtorch, a blowtorch is blue, it's hotter, candle flame is yellow, red, it's cooler. Um, so that's in the visible light, but if you go even cooler, then you can be emitting infrared or even radio waves. If you go even hotter, you can be emitting ultraviolet X-rays, and then really hot is into the gamma rays. So that's what these things do. They actually emit, they're very hot, they're in the X-ray regime primarily for their uh, primary luminosity. Um, so that's what we end up with. We have a binary. So we have two objects, making it a binary. We've got this compact object in the center, either a neutron star or a black hole, which I'll talk more about in a minute, and in orbit with a sun-like star. Um, the gravitational pull uh, from the compact object distorts the star into a teardrop shape, uh, causes a tidal, just for the same reason the moon causes a high tide uh, on Earth, raising a high tide in our oceans. Uh, the compact object is causing a tidal force on the side of the star, distorting it into a teardrop shape and actually pulling off some of the atmosphere and into an accretion disk, and then the material basically goes down the drain and onto the compact object. Um, the temperatures that you get uh, at the center of the disk are extremely hot. They're up to 
10 million degrees. And when you're up at 10 million degrees, you're in the X-ray regime of emission. So um, that's why these things are known as X-ray binaries, because most of their light comes out in the X-ray, and there's two objects. So hence, X-ray binary. One of the few things in astronomy that is named in a way that makes sense. Um, so, but they're very tiny. These are very, very tiny creatures. And here's uh, kind of a representation family of some of the black hole ones, uh, to scale. So this is sun mercury distance here at the top. So that's a uh, 0.4 AU for those of you keeping score. Um, and then here's some of the disks and the stars. You can see some of these are very, very tiny. Um, a lot of these are even earth moon distance apart. So very tiny, tiny creatures. Um, but because of their high luminosity, in the X-ray, they can be actually 10,000 times more luminous than the sun. So if you could see the night sky in the X-rays with your eyes, you would see many, many thousands, hundreds of points of light in the sky, all emitting X-ray radiation. Um, Scorpius X1 in the constellation Scorpio is our brightest one, it's the nearest one. Um, and it is, it would be 10,000 times more luminous than the sun if you could see it in the X-rays. But of course we can't see X-rays with our eyes, so we don't see them. Um, but they're just little points of light in the optical that you can see with a telescope. So, here's a test for you. Can you spot the X-ray binary in this picture? Um, this is uh, an image I took uh, as part of my work at uh, UT, uh, out at the McDonald Observatory, on the lovely 82-inch Otto Struve telescope, celebrating 75 years. Um, so this is what they look like. There's kind of an animation of it. And the X-ray binary in optical is one of these dots. <laughs> you got it? You want, no, here, I'll help you out. It's actually that one. Um, <laughs> So yes, the, uh, the leftmost of those four is actually the X-ray binary. Um, so these things just look like points of light in the sky. They don't look like anything more than a normal star. So how in the world do we know it's a binary and it looks like this creature down here? Well, there's a couple of ways. We don't just observe them in X-ray radiation. In fact, when I observe them, I typically observe them in the UV and optical light. Um, they emit in all types of radiation. Just most of their energy is coming out in the X-ray, but that's not where all of their energy is coming out. Um, if you have a black hole, you could have a jet coming from the black hole. Um, jets can emit either radio and or X-ray, sometimes both. Um, if you have uh, observed in the infrared, and this is a low mass star, something lower mass than our own sun, it's gonna be cooler and so we emit uh, infrared light, our sun emits optical light. If it's cooler, it's going to emit infrared light. So you, sometimes you can pick out the uh, infrared star. Um, optical light, you can see the companion sometimes in the optical. And the outer edge of this disk is cooler than the inner part of the disk. And so that observes in the optical. As you go further and further into the disk, you get hotter and hotter and hotter. So you go from optical light on the edge into the UV and kind of the middle edge, middle part of the disk, and then into X-ray towards the inner edge of the disk. So by observing in these different wavelengths, we can actually map out what the actual disk looks like, even though we're just looking at a point of light in the sky. So it's really having the ability to observe in different wavelengths that gives us the tools to model what this looks like. And being a binary, uh, they're in orbit around each other, and so there's a change in brightness as the stars orbit each other. Um, it's not a constant brightness, and there'll be a modulation with the same period as the binary orbit. So that tells us something uh, about the, the distance of the binary and the masses in the binary, um, depending on how long that takes to uh, orbit. So why do we observe these? Well, it's really impossible for us to create in a laboratory setting these temperatures and pressures. Um, these type of plasma, it's a very exotic type of plasma physics. Quite often there's very high magnetic fields that we can't generate in a lab. And so this is a great place to study some really exotic physics that we don't really understand. Um, we can't create it in a laboratory. 
And so we have to look out in space. Nature has kindly produced these things for us. Um, so we can observe those and understand them better. These are not the only type of systems that have these type of disks. But the nice thing about X-ray binaries is that it's one of the few systems where by looking at the different wavelength regimes, we can actually discern what the disk looks like. And many other systems, we can't do that. And so this is uh, a nice system for testing these type of physics. <coughs> Pardon, I need a drink of beer. <laughs> okay, so where do these compact objects that I've been talking about come from? Um, so uh, I'm sure you're familiar with super duper supernova over here, or whatever Jeff's name is. Um, <laughs> um, so these compact objects come from supernova, um, and these are actually creatures I currently study in my present research. Um, so what you have is a very high mass star, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with what a supernova is. Um, you take a high mass star, so we're talking eight times the mass of the sun or greater. Um, all stars uh, in their core are doing hydrogen to helium fusion. High mass star, like our sun, um, high mass stars are going a little bit further and fusing heavier elements into even heavier elements. So the helium into carbon oxygen, carbon oxygen up into magnesium, up into iron. Um, but all stars are doing some sort of nuclear fusion in their core. That's good because gravity is trying to collapse the star down. And so as long as you have nuclear fusion in the core, that's a pressure that's going outwards. That's counterbalancing gravity going inwards. And as long as out equals in, you have a happy, stable star, like our sun. What happens eventually, however, is that the fuel that's causing the nuclear reaction starts running out. And when it runs out in a high mass star, um, suddenly and very violently, um, the nuclear fusions uh, slow down, suddenly gravity wins over the outward pressure and you don't have a balance anymore, the whole thing collapses and the rebounding shock wave ends up blowing the entire star apart. So that's a supernova in a nutshell. Our sun will not do this. It's not massive enough. You have to be eight times the mass of the sun or greater. Um, but the remnants that are left over, you have this debris flying out, um, an example of which is uh, our lovely crab Oops, Crab Nebula here. Um, so you have this debris flying out that was once the star. And in the middle of that nebula, you have the core of the star left over. And in this case, it's a neutron star. Um, if we look at it in the X-ray, you can actually see the neutron star. So this is a Chandra image, X-ray image, of the neutron star at the middle. And then it does have a disk around it. Um, as some of this uh, material is actually starting to fall back onto the neutron star itself. So that's uh, one of my favorite images, actually, of uh, a neutron star. If the explosion um, was from a very high mass star, or if the explosion wasn't actually messy, if you think about having a messy explosion, um, stuff blows all over the place, and so the remnant left over isn't that massive, and you have a neutron star. Um, if you have a very high mass star, the remnant is going to be even more massive, and so then you end up with a black hole. So if you have a low mass core left over, you have a neutron star. If you have a high mass core remnant left over, you end up with a black hole. Um, so what happens in these things? Well, um, I didn't include in this the white dwarfs. So there's actually three types of compact objects, a white dwarf, neutron star, and black hole. Um, the white dwarf is what our sun will eventually become. Um, in the picture of the butterfly nebula going around, um, the middle of the butterfly nebula has a white dwarf in it. Um, and just like a regular star, it has to have something to hold itself up against gravity trying to collapse it. Well, a white dwarf doesn't have nuclear reactions going on like a normal star does. What it does have is the typically carbon and oxygen atoms are so compressed that it's actually the rigidity of an electron itself that is holding it up against gravitational collapse. So the, the mere fact that the electrons are touching each other and packed in on each other is what's halting gravitational collapse. And that's what keeps a white dwarf uh, stable. 
take that one step further, so the ma masses of white dwarfs are about the same mass as the sun. Their size is about the same as the Earth. So take something the size of the Earth and give it the mass of the sun and you have a white dwarf. Go a little bit further, higher mass, and you end up with a neutron star. Now, the higher the mass, stronger the gravity, so it's compressing it even more. And so now the protons and neutrons have fused together into neutrons, and you have a giant ball of neutrons. So you have the rigidity now of a neutron instead of an electron, holding it up against gravity. And so you basically have a giant ball of neutrons. These things run about one and a half times the mass of the sun, and they have a diameter of about 20 kilometers, so the size of Austin. These things are tiny, but very, very compact. Um, and it is the fact that the neutrons themselves have some structure is what's keeping it up against the collapse of gravity. Once you get ab above about three, and this is somewhat of an embarrassment in the field in that we don't know what the number is, somewhere between two and a half and five, um, the mass of the, the mass becomes so great that the rigidity of a neutron star can't hold it up against gravity anymore, and the whole thing implodes on itself, and we get a black hole. By definition, a black hole has infinite density. Um, it, does not it does not have a radius, but it does have a mass. So that gives it uh, an infinite density. Um, and you can grow a black hole to very, very large uh, sizes. The ones I'm going to be talking about range in the 4 to 20 times the mass of the sun. When we start talking about um, black holes that are in the center of galaxies, which I'm not going to talk about, but um, I'm sure you could ask Steve about, um, those are ours in the center of our galaxy is a couple million times that of the sun. Supermassive ones are a few billion times the mass of the sun. Um, so those are the things that anchor galaxies. Um, these little guys come from just a single star. So these are the ones I'm going to be talking about. Okay. Now, just one note on uh, pulsars. Um, some neutron stars are pulsars. If they have a very high magnetic field, um, the magnetic field can actually launch uh, protons and electrons off of the surface and the resulting radiation out into space. Now, these things rotate very quickly, and the, um, the radiation that's launched off comes from the magnetic pole of the neutron star. And so you end up with a lighthouse effect. Uh, the magnetic field is not aligned with the rotation axis, typically. The magnetic field on Earth is not aligned with our rotation axis. It's off a little bit. Um, and so as it sweeps through, you end up with this lighthouse effect as the beam passes um, our line of sight. And that's known as a pulsar. So you get this flash every now and again, a pulsing uh, beam of light as the thing rotates by. Rotation periods are very fast. Um, the slowest is eight, actually eight and a half seconds. Um, the fastest are in milliseconds. Uh, the fastest one is actually uh, 750 hertz. So 750 times a second, this thing is doing one rotation on its spin axis. Now these things are tiny. You remember it's 10 to 20 kilometers big. So um, spinning up that fast isn't too hard for a neutron star. Okay, so this is, um, so I'll talk a little bit about black holes um, and gravity in space time. So I'm going to delve into general relativity, so bear with me. Um, and this is a horrible analogy, um, but it's the one everybody uses, so I'm going to use it. Um, so imagine the uh, space as a rubber sheet. And so if you took a rubber sheet and stuck a bowling ball in the middle of it, it would bend the rubber sheet. Um, so that's kind of what we talk about when we talk about space. Space is this rubber sheet, and anything with mass represents a bowling ball. The more mass, the more the sheet bends. Okay. Um, this was proven by Einstein um, oops, um, during a solar eclipse, um, uh, proving general relativity uh, as Einstein uh, was hypothesizing. 
that um, the idea is that light from a star has to travel along the sheet. It can't deviate off the sheet. It has to travel along the sheet. Um, so if there is no mass in the way, it will just make a straight line. But if there is something large in the way, like the sun, then the position of the star will appear to move. And this was proven during a solar eclipse because the sun was blocked out. So we could see the stars that were around the sun. And lo and behold, the stars that were near the sun were not where they were supposed to be. They had actually shifted because the sun's gravity bent space and therefore bent the direction that light was traveling from. And that proved uh, general relativity. Um, and it happened early on in, I think it was in the early, late 30s, early 40s that this was uh, actually proven. So taking that analogy of a step further, if you get a very compact object, white dwarf, neutron star, black hole, the dip becomes even greater. Um, so you have end up with, um, instead of a small-ish dip like the sun, you get a larger dip for a white dwarf, an even larger dip for a neutron star. And then this is where the analogy breaks down because the dip becomes infinity for a black hole. This is where it becomes a bad analogy. But nevertheless, um, <laughs> that's what we end up with. Um, the point where light can't escape anymore uh, from a black hole is known as the event horizon. So um, just as when we were going to the moon, the Apollo missions had to go close to the escape velocity of the Earth to escape Earth's gravity and go to the moon. Um, the more mass something has, the faster your escape velocity has to be to overcome gravity to get away from that object. Um, when you talk about a black hole, when that escape velocity becomes the speed of light, that defines where the event horizon is. The closer you are to it, the faster your velocity has to be, the stronger the gravitational pull. Further you are away, less speed you need, less the gravitational pull. So where the escape velocity equals the speed of light, that's known as the event horizon. So there's no additional, black holes don't suck, which is where I come to my title. There is no additional sucking force that's pulling you into a black hole. It's just gravity. Um, a black hole that had a mass of the sun would act not much differently than our own sun in terms of gravity. We wouldn't notice a whole lot if you replace the sun with a one solar mass black hole. Um, other than there would be no light in the sky. But in terms of our orbit, it wouldn't change much. Um, so it's just gravity that's pulling you into a black hole. It's really nothing else. So um, just kind of a summary. So uh, X-ray binaries are the most energetic systems for their size in the universe. They're very efficient at converting gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy and then into thermal energy. Um, being very, very bright, um, an, an X-ray mission, an X-ray telescope uh, actually melted uh, back in the 90s um, because they were very careful to not slew the X-ray telescope over the sun because the sun does emit X-ray radiation and it's very bright even in the X-rays. Um, they knew better than to do that. But they did slew it over Scorpius X1, which is the brightest X-ray binary, and which happens to be 10,000 times more luminous than the sun <laughs> in X-rays. And the telescope melted <laughs> when they did this. Um, and that was the end of that telescope. Um, so they are extremely bright, um, but they're very tiny. Typically, Earth-Moon distance is not unusual. They have orbit orbital periods of a few hours. Um, and so, and the compact object is either a neutron star or a black hole. Um, and there is, I said, there's this embarrassment among the field where we don't really know where the dividing line in mass between a neutron star and a black hole is. This is one reason why X-ray binaries are so interesting because the matter from the star is accreting onto a neutron star. And so that means typically a neutron star by itself is about one and a half times the mass of the sun. As it accretes matter from its companion, that mass grows. And so we've seen in X-ray binaries 
two solar masses, 2.3 solar masses, maybe two and a half solar masses. It's trying to find wit what is the most massive neutron star. The most massive neutron star is going to be in one of these systems. And so trying to figure out where the high line is and then there's also a push in the other direction to find where is the lowest mass black hole. Now, unfortunately, observationally, there seems to be no objects sitting in there between two and a half and five. Um, there's hints at maybe a four solar mass black hole. Um, the kind of accepted value is about three, but we don't know, honestly. And this has been a problem that's plagued the field since the 60s. And we still don't know um, because there are no objects at that mass that we have yet observed. But if we're going to observe a high mass neutron star, it's going to be in uh, one of these systems because it's accreting that matter. Um, and they are very, they're all unique. Um, we know of about 50. Um, most of them are in our own galaxy. So we're not looking outside of our distant galaxy in the Hubble Deep Field. These are sitting all in our own backyard. A few are in Andromeda, a few are in the Triangulum Galaxy, M33, but most are in our own neighborhood. Um, but they can be very tiny, and they don't have to have a sun-like star as their compact object. Some of them actually have a white dwarf as their compact object. Um, so it's a double compact object. There's a neutron star in the middle of the disk, but a white dwarf instead of a sun-like star uh, on the outside. And they're very tiny. This one has an orbit of about 11 minutes. And this is to scale. There's the Earth and there's our sun down there. So very, very tiny. And so I leave you with uh, this movie that I hope will play. There we go. Um, so this is a radio image of the jets from SS-433. Um, this is a black hole system. And the fun thing about it is you can see the disk here. And you can see the jets are actually pretty blobby. They're not uh, coming off uh, in a nice straight line. I think this will replay. Um, but the jets are actually precessing. It's not just shooting off in one direction. It's actually twisting. So you can see this corkscrew uh, starting to happen as the jets come off. So uh, that's kind of a fun radio observation of one of these systems. And uh, thank you very much. All righty. We have time for just a couple of questions before we finish up here. Woo, lots of hands went up. Let's go right here in front. What was the first black hole discovered? Was the first black hole discovered? Um, so two questions. Two, well, uh, the f so the first two possibilities, and I don't actually know the exact answer, um, but two possibilities. The first, so we didn't even know the black holes necessarily existed. Um, SIG X1 is probably one of the first confirmed for an X-ray binary. Um, so that was the, the image I showed at the very beginning. Um, for a black hole in our Milky Way, the black hole in our Milky Way galaxy was probably the first definitive proof that a black hole exists. Um, because we have mapped high mass stars in orbit around the black hole. Um, and actually if you Google it, there's a movie of this and it's pretty awesome. Um, but these high mass stars, we've seen a full orbit of some of these over the decade or so. And they get very close to a, a very high mass thing and their orbit tells us what the mass of that thing is and how close they get tells us how big the thing is and there's nothing there. So, so there's something very, very massive that's very tiny that's emitting no light. Physics says that's a black hole. So. All right, one more question. Let's go right here. So the question is, we've only observed 50. Are they common or not common? Or are we not observing them? Um, so 50 is, they're not that common. Um, we see them, Chandra X-ray telescope actually picks them out pretty easy. Um, in a Chandra image of a galaxy, you see these very bright pops of individual pixels throughout an entire galaxy, and these are the X-ray binaries. Um, it's hard for us to see them because most of them are in the disk plane, 
and there's das, um, gas and dust in the way. So um, particularly ones that have a very high mass companion, uh, like SIGX1. Um, if they're on the other side of the galaxy, they're hard for us to see. So a lot of the ones that we can see are nearby, so there's some observational bias to that. All right, we are needing to wrap it up, so let's thank Baroness von Binary one more time. She'll be around for a bit if you want to ask her more stuff.